Dr. Sarah Schnitger is a professor of psychology and neuroscience at Baylor University. And in a unique turn, this expert on personality and social influence has taken an interest in sport. A self-described sport doubter, Sarah studies virtue and character development in spirituality and religion, and has found an interesting comparison in the world of sport. On today's podcast, Sarah shares her research, including a unique look at the virtue of patience in life and in sports. Let's get started. We're so excited to have Sarah Schnicker with us today on, on the show. Sarah, thanks so much for being here. We're going to start with the, uh, our standard question about sport in your life. What can you tell us? Well, I am probably a little bit different than your typical guest. I am a real sport doubter. <laughs> and I, um, I did not have a friendly relationship with sports growing up. So I'm a very tall person. Um, by the age of 11, I was five foot 10, um, which is, yeah, exceptionally tall. So everyone always thought I should be playing sports. I played basketball in elementary school for a season and cried every game. <laughs> I, yes, yeah, so I've learned over the years, I just don't like competition. Um, and so it's odd that I came to study sports. Um, I think the opposite is typically true. It's the folks who love it, did sports their whole lives, or even professional or elite athletes themselves. But I came to it um, more on a discovery of like, what is this thing that people love so much <laughs> that I found difficult? Um, what is it doing for folks? Why is it touted as character development? What was I missing out on? Um, or was some of my skepticism and dislike warranted just what's going on with this thing called sports that um, I was not a part of? Um, so I'm the cultural outsider as a researcher in the sports world. Um, the cultural good outsider. Thing. We should have yeah. both. We should have insiders and outsiders with any kind of context we're studying. And there's so much that comes from from body type, right? You said that you were tall and and, and were yes. ex expected to be a part of sport. And so oftentimes that can be off-putting. I mean, uh, coming from the world of basketball, that's oftentimes the case where there's tall people and people, you know, assume, yeah, hey, you should be a basketball player, but but maybe aren't. Right. So what can, what can you tell us about, uh, about faith in your life? Yes. Yeah, so faith, I would say, um, as a researcher of psychology of religion, I'm definitely more of an insider there. Um, so my faith has been really important to me my whole life. Um, grew up in a very devout um, Christian family. And um, as an adolescent, young adult, really um, explored what it means to have faith and what it means for that to be something of my own and not just something inherited culturally. Um, and so my faith really is very much integrated in my work, um, trying to understand how human beings were created in the image of God and what it means for human beings to thrive and flourish, um, and understand, um, I think in my own life, I saw ways that religion and spirituality, um, really were an amazing resource for my development, um, but also seeing in many lives the ways that religion and spirituality were harmful <laughs> and were used as weapons. Um, and just really curious about kind of the experiences I had, other experiences I saw and what's going on here, why um, is religion so powerful and what is the good it does and what are the dangers it holds? Um, I'm just trying to understand that um, it was always very interesting to me. Well, Sarah, first I want to say thanks so much for being with us. I, I am drawn to the doubters. I love the doubters, <laughs> right? So uh, I'm engaged in sport all the time. I tend to be a voice that uh, is constantly putting on the brakes uh, in the, in uh, the conversations about sport and Christianity. So the doubters really help me. And the people that just wonder about the place of competition in sport um, help sharpen and refine us. So I'm really thrilled that you're uh, with us, but also that you're doing the kind of research that you're doing. It's, it's, uh, it's, yeah. it's exciting for us to be able to have that. 
so we've heard a little bit about your reluctant sport life, uh, <laughs> about your faith life and how you're engaged there. Uh, I guess I'm wondering, give us something. Now, the, the uh, viewers don't know this, but I am I am looking at you uh, in your summer hat season. Uh, yes. Folks don't know that about you. <laughs> give us something else that maybe, you know, is a little more obscure, something that people don't know about you that helps us get to know you. Um. Well, I don't know how obscure it is, but I am a mom. I have a five-year-old daughter. Um, I have an amazing family. My husband um, is a nursing home administrator. So um, the pandemic season was quite wild for our family. Um, so we're very excited for things to be calming down. Um, Yep, I live in Waco, Texas, which, but after like 18 years in California, so we are still adjusting three years in Waco. Um, I love to travel, and so um, exciting, itching to get back out there in the world. And um, I think I've been to six of the seven continents now, so just Antarctica is my last on the list. Um, but that might be a while before that happens. <laughs> That's kind of a far cry from Waco, especially in the summer. You might yes. love to go to Antarctica. That would be fabulous. And, and you gave me a, a, a quick chance for a commercial. Come on out to England next year when we have our third global congress on sports oh. Christianity. Yeah, so yes. I don't know if you've been to Cambridge, but uh, that'll be the location of our third global congress in August, uh, August 18th through 21, 2022. And hopefully Very we're all traveling fun. at that time. It'd be yes. Fun to do that. <laughs> so Sarah, we don't have, you know, we don't have like a, a full lineup of neuroscientists on our uh, on our docket, right? So this is great for us to uh, delve into a particularly new area. So I'm wondering if you could just start by giving us some sense of the the research work that you do in general and how that uh, has been connected to sport most recently. Yes. Yeah, so. I am trained as a personality and social psychologist. Um, so what that means as a personality and social psychologist, I try to study um, who human beings are. So what makes us each individual, kind of our unique personalities. That's kind of the personality part. But then also what we all share as social creatures. So what are the ways that our situations and conflict and um, contexts and environments shape us? And so it's kind of this back and forth between who the person is and what they bring to the table and then the environment that they're in and how that influences them. And really the dynamic interaction between the person and their context. Um, and so in general, my work is really about religion and spirituality as a context in which people develop um, and that people internalize those ideals as part of themselves, um, but then are shaped and influenced by uh, their religious context, their spiritual kind of dialogues with other people in their lives. Um, and so very broadly, that's what I'm looking at. And I like to say, right, my religion, Research is on how religion and spirituality facilitate and hinder the development of character strengths and virtues. Um, so all my work is really focused there. Um, but a couple of years ago, I really got into thinking about sports <laughs> as an interesting context that has many overlaps with religion. Um, you know, it's interesting in psychology of religion, we think about what um, what are alternatives to kind of traditional religions, <laughs> right? So um, what are other kind of ideologies or groups that really have the same emotional impact that have devotion and worship involved? And sports is one of the ones that always comes up, right? People can treat it like a religion, um, so I found this very curious. And then, especially in the United States, and I think probably around the world, though, we see people intermix their religion and their sport and their athletics in really interesting ways. Um, and so I just started to become fascinated with what is going on here. Um, how does this religious kind of sporty context that especially young adults and adolescents find themselves in, how does it shape them? 
Um, does it help them flourish? Does it help them build character? Um, does it not? And really, when does it help them? And when does it lead to negative outcomes? Um, so that's kind of my big question <laughs> and the discipline I come from that helps me answer it. So you found some really interesting things in some of this research related to sport. You know, you do so much of this uh, social personality psychology outside of sport, but that related to sport, share with us some of your conclusions here. What are the things that you found based on the studies? Yeah. So, um, so first of all, with the literature, before I started looking at this, um, the literature in general is really kind of mixed on the effects of sports on character. So it really depends on a lot of different ifs of the context. So if you have a coach who supports autonomy and who has the, the right ideas about personal development, then it really builds character. If you have a coach who wants to win at all costs, then you actually see increased cheating and ethical violations both on and off the field. So it's very contextual. And a lot of the research was looking kind of at the external factors. Um, with our work, we started to look at what are the motivations of the athletes themselves? Um, and I really need to acknowledge Ben Holtberg, my main collaborator on a lot of this work as well as Ken Wang. Um, we collaborated several years and continue to collaborate on other projects. So I want to give a shout out to them because <laughs> they, uh, this would not have happened without them. Um, but right, we started to look at what are the internalized narratives, ideas, motivations of the athlete? Um, and why are they doing what we do? They do. Um, and so we have a couple different studies we've done. Um, so the first one I can talk about is with um, Team World Vision. Have you all ever heard of this? Yep. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. with World Vision International. Um, Team World Vision is where they have people train to run half and full marathons um, to raise money for clean water in about eight to 10 African countries. Um, it's been a wildly successful fundraising arm of World Vision. <laughs> um, and People just really get passionate about raising funds, um, thinking about folks in places where there's not clean water, um, having to walk or run miles and miles to get their water. And so thinking about us here um, who are economically privileged to um, run for a cause <laughs> so other people don't have to. So we thought this was such an interesting context because when you go to kind of training meetings with Team World Vision, there is so much more than just training for the race, right? There's a big message there of we run so others don't have to, that we're doing this for the sake of other people, um, but also not just for the sake of other people, for the sake of God and our, in the kingdom of God and doing God's work in the world. Um, and so we started to observe this context and notice too that the runners, especially some of the adolescents or young adults, they kind of varied in the degree to which they internalized the messaging from Team World Vision. So some of them were just there because their friends were there. <laughs> and so I'll show up too. Um, some were there because, oh, this seems like a way, great way to get healthy and fit and um, meet my fitness goals and train for to get my body in top shape. Um, whereas others are really there because of the pro-social or spiritual messaging. Um, and so, and also, so I've done a half marathon once in my life. So even though I was not big in sports, I did, um, as a college student, young adult, did actually start to work, like find joy in just working out alone. <laughs> and um, so I know though, just how much training goes into it and how much self-control and patience and perseverance is required. And it seems like, oh, maybe this is kind of a naturalistic intervention for people that helps them build these strengths. And would we be able to quantify that empirically? Um, 
So we started to follow the runners as they signed up to train with Team World Vision and then follow them the time throughout their whole 15 or 18 or however many weeks of training, um, measured kind of what they were doing character-wise, spiritually, what was going on, um, had them go to race day. Uh, and then a week or two after race measured kind of all their psychological characteristics again. And then two months after that followed up. So really trying to get track them across time throughout this meaningful process. Um, and it was interesting. So we didn't find that on a whole, everyone increased in any of the virtues we were looking at. <laughs> if anything, some of the things went down. Um, which is not what we'd expect, um, but also can make sense because oftentimes when you try to be patient or have self-control or be generous, you suddenly realize how much harder it is <laughs> than before you were actually trying to do this thing, right? So yeah, I'm a patient person. And then the pandemic hits, you're like, nope, not so patient, having trouble waiting because now it's being tested. So we weren't completely shocked by that. And there might be a measurement effect. Um, but the interesting thing was that why they were running mattered. So when participants increased um, in their spiritual or pro-social reasons from running versus just their health and fitness, they also increased in their virtues. So if they um, were becoming more and more invested in the transcendent aspects of training, doing it for other people, doing it for God, they became more patient. They had more generosity. <laughs> um, so finding that the reason, the why for the running really made a difference in their character development. Does that all make sense? It does. And it leads to lots of follow-up questions uh, as we mm -hmm. think about, uh, and, and I think uh, Chad would say the same thing that, uh, as sport people, we're hearing all these sorts of things, these sort of triggers in many ways for us to try to make these connections. You've said that earlier uh, that uh, sport itself sometimes has positive effects or virtuous effects and sometimes the opposite. But it's interesting mm -hmm. that in the world of sport, no one talks about the negative. In fact, it's almost universal that uh, folks will say sports builds character. And what they're saying is that it's really good, right? It's really positive. So it's amazing, <laughs> even though people live it, uh, experience it, um, it, it has just unbelievable shelf life in terms of you know being a positive thing. Uh, right. And so uh, maybe that's true about religion too. Uh, in some I think ways. so, right? Yeah. People who are religious tend to see all the good things. Yeah. And it's the people who are not religious who are like, well, what about this? What about the sexual abuse in the church? What about the prejudice and discrimination, et cetera, et cetera, right? We tend to have our biases, of course. Um, yeah. As a it's, scientist, I try to look at both sides. It's not easy, but we try. <laughs> right. And it's a it's a tough message to tell, right? Uh, once you right. find you get the results of your research, you, uh, you sort of uh, try to ex uh, change the narrative a little bit and... and yep. Uh, allow people to to have appropriate expectations for the things that they're engaging in. But this this social context is so fascinating, right? That you're you're trying to figure out uh, how uh, this engagement with sport actually does this. And and so I want to try to break out some pieces, if possible. So mm -hmm. you know, there's there's a lot of things where uh, we take something that people inherently do, and then we tie a cause to it, right? Yes. So this is an example, and sometimes it's it's connected to fundraising, for instance. Uh, this particular case, it's connected to fundraising. So for these people that you say had a positive effect, they found meaning somewhere in there. Yes. Uh, do you think that anything else in the place of sport would have worked as well? So, for instance, if, if this were sort of... Uh, crafting, making clothes. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out how much of this was actual an actual sport context. Um, yep. Because, you know, sometimes people engage. I'll give you an a real quick example. I work for an organization called The First Tee, or I uh, have been on the board, and they have these really successful golf marathons. So they take mm -hmm. these golfers, and then you go bother all your friends forever and get them to pledge 
for the number of holes you're going to play, right? And so you might play 150 golf holes in a single day and everybody pays a dollar for each hole that you complete. And my my uh, sort of outside observation of that is that that's a great fundraising element, but it's not actually golf. Somebody is golfing, but that is not actually the sport of golf. And I'm trying to figure out in this running, was it actually the sport of running? Uh, right. So th- those, I'm sorry, I'm yeah. a slow person to ask that question. Well, and right, our data, I don't know if our data here can actually answer that question. Um, but I can make a couple hypotheses that we could start to test. So um, there's a couple thoughts. So the first thing, so because we know from other studies that whenever you, we call this sanctification, not in the theological sense, but in, we use it as a psychological term of imbuing a mundane activity with spiritual meaning. <laughs> So people regularly sanctify their marriages, their parenting, their work, right? So they take something that isn't necessarily spiritual and view it with sacred um, meaning behind it. And in general, we always find that when you sanctify something, a goal, a relationship, you exert more effort, (laughs) it changes how you go about doing it. Um, And it normally has a lot of benefits except when you fail. When you fail, you now have a desecration of the sacred. And it's much more, um, it has a lot more negative well-being impacts, right? So when a marriage fails that sacred, it's much more devastating than for someone who hadn't sanctified it. Um, So in some ways, right, what's going on here is they're sanctifying a marathon training and running. but is that any different than if they sanctified, right, their crafting or something of that sort? So there's a couple of things I see as distinct. So one is that sports are typically involve the whole body. <laughs> um, and we know that in humans are physical beings and there's a whole literature on psychological embodiment and that what you do with your body actually changes your emotion and cognitions pretty significantly, Um, right? So when you kind of push something, when you, and they'll do these studies in the lab where they'll have people do these actions and then measure their attitudes. It's like when you push something away, you have a negative attitude toward it. (laughs) Whereas you pull it towards you, you have a positive. Even they've done studies where they gave people a drink to hold. And if it's warm, the people have warmer attitudes and judgments of the person they're interacting with. Whereas if it's a cold, icy drink, they don't like the person as much and have cool feelings. So we know that there's embodiment really matters. And so where you're sanctifying this kind of high arousal, physiologically taxing activity, (laughs) that is going to be different (laughs) than if it were a sedentary um, activity. Now, how exactly, I'm not sure, Um, but it's going to lead to higher arousal, um, most definitely, right? Running, it's going to be much more physically engaging. Um, So I would expect that it would magnify all the effects, um, having that much bodily involvement, Um, right? It just couldn't help but do that. But that's a little different from actually being a competition, right? As you were mentioning with your golf example. Um, And that, there is not a lot out there on. Um, You've sparked me today. (laughs) Like, ah, I can think of ways we could study this, right? So we could set up people in an experiment. It probably had to be more of an experimental setup where we have them running and look at their character development. And for some of it, just run. Whereas in other kind of conditions, we could have them actually racing. (laughs) Um, And we can manipulate what kind of prize is there um, if someone's actually looking at their ranking. Um, But we just don't know right now. I think... um, And that's a question I really have, right? And that's where my personal experience 
it makes me doubt whether the competition aspect really is the character developing aspect or not. I think it pushes people to their limits. That is something it does. Um, and that the question of can you push your people to your limits without the competition? Well, you've helped. Um, yeah, you've helped me a lot here in understanding. I love the way that you described the the sanctifying of a particular thing. It helps me divide some of these things out and try to get a piece mm-hmm. of it. Right. And I do think, too, the embodiment aspect is something largely not unique to sport because there are other things that are equally as embodying. But also there's a draining, right? There's a suffering. There's a like pushing yourself to the limit. Sometimes competition does that. And sometimes there are other sort of manual tests that get us to that point. I think that embodiment is a unique thing. Um, and you know, I don't want to get you off, but I, I would love if you continue to, to do research in that area, uh, where competition is central, you know, Chad and I have found, we've not done our own research on this, but we've kind of written on, on sort of the negative, uh, side of that when we talk about envy. Uh, and so right. in a competitive environment, there's a, a researcher in, in France who sort of looked at it and applied his, re- his work in economics to sport and just put people in competitive environments and notice how um, envy can be a result of that sort of thing. So interesting <laughs> stuff. Oh. And uh, we'll wait for that for the next podcast. That'll be yes. fantastic. And that, for me, too, it makes me wonder what what is the very framing of an activity as competitive tell you about the fundamental nature of the world, (laughs) right? Whereas, and I think this is a really interesting intersection with faith, right? So is it saying there's a scarcity of resources that only some people can be winners and some are losers and there's scarcity there? Um, which is probably why I personally didn't like sports <laughs> or is it an abundance framework, right? Which would be no, more natural when there's not a competition that we can all achieve our best <laughs> and that it's not framed in terms of winners and losers. It's in train framed in terms of the common good and how can we lift everyone? Um, right. And I think spiritually that could be really important because I see people frame their spiritual lives in terms of the good guys and the bad guys, the spiritual winners and the spiritual losers. And that just goes against the theology I hold, (laughs) where God's love is abundant and unlimited and um, not earned and isn't tied to performance. So I think that is something those who are committed to competition have to wrestle with. And think about what is being taught there about the fundamental nature of human existence. We see so much of sport as being zero sum like that, especially competitive yeah. sport. You know, the world competitive sport is zero sum. We have winners and we have losers. Um, you know, running isn't the only example, but certainly is an example of something that gets away from that a little bit. Or it's easier right. to see some of the goods outside of winning or losing when one competes or participates in in a race, for instance, especially an endurance race where there seems to be no yep. scarcity of of um, positives that can come out of it. You know, you're trying to finish and that's between you and yourself. It's not between you and somebody else. You're, you're trying to you're trying to finish. And that's what we have going on here in the study that you guys were doing, which is really, really interesting. You, you talked about one of the other sort of fundamental goods of of running, which is health and fitness. And you mentioned that 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 seemed to be something that would be less of a sacralizing agent uh, towards towards one's meaning structure, towards one's, um, uh, you know, ability to, to develop in, uh, in in pro-social ways, right? Um, as opposed to if we, if, if one were to sacralize or, or find deeper meaning in, in sport. And that, that sort of um, makes me think a little bit differently about participation in, in sports, because, uh, you know, so much of what we say is, well, if you didn't win or lose, well, at least you're getting health benefits, out of this, right? So Brian and I both have PE backgrounds, and that's that, that's a part of it, right? So we can we can say, you know, if even if you don't win, even if you're not good at sports, you know, uh, you're getting health benefits out of those. But that doesn't seem to be something that provides a deep meaning structure to the participation, does it? Right, right. It's not the same level of meaning um, and holistic. And I think I mean it's a little complex because you could still sanctify the health benefits, right? And this is why psychology is so difficult because 
right? I know when I'm doing my physical fitness and workouts and um, I actually sanctify the health benefits of I can um, do God's work in the world if I have a healthy body and I take care of it. And I'll be like, and the literature shows that your spiritual feelings really depend on how much sleep you have and how your body feels, right? So, I mean, it's not completely separate, um, right? But you need, if you have that only, um, it doesn't get you there in terms of the meaning system that you need to really cultivate virtues. Um, you need something richer and deeper to connect to. Um, and just my physical health <laughs> alone um, Probably won't do that. Um, and that's a very fragile meaning system because eventually all of us, our physical health falters and fails. We all die. <laughs> um, and so if that's the thing you're holding on to, which I think for a lot of people in the United States in particular, um, youth and physical health and the body really becomes its own kind of main thing of purpose in life, of eating the right things. And it's almost a sense of control to try to say, I can control my own body. <laughs> and it just, it doesn't hold up over time. Um, I see it in my husband's work running a nursing home, right? These are people who no longer can care physically. Um, and some of them still have a deep meaning system that allows them to thrive and flourish despite their physical limitations. Um, but a lot of people really struggle um, to find meaning when our bodies do start to deteriorate. Yeah, that issue of control is such an important one, such an interesting one when it comes to our, our physical abilities, right? And so um, one of the things you measured seems to, to fly in the face of that, right? So uh, measuring uh, patience. Mm -hmm. Patience would be in some ways the ability to withstand not having perfect control, total control over things. So what did you find related to, to patients and, and maybe why patients? Yes. No, I mean, that's, yeah, great segue is, you know, I started to study patients because no one in the world, I mean, no one was studying it in psychology. <laughs> I remember I started as my, my first year of grad school. Um, so I worked with Bob Emmons at UC Davis, and he's a big researcher in this field of positive psychology. Um, which really began in the late 90s, trying to say what goes well with people instead of looking at mental illness and what goes wrong with human beings, what goes well? What does it mean to thrive? And can we study those kind of qualities alongside depression or anxiety and things like that? Um, and so I just noted, I'm like, there's tons of character strengths being studied. We love gratitude. We love perseverance. We love grit. We love all these kind of active virtues. Um, yeah, I was like, who's studying patience? No one. I had four sources, and one of them was Darwin <laughs> on <laughs> the expression of emotion in man and animals. Like, and we have things related to patients in psychology, but we weren't really studying it as a human strength and virtue. Um, and I think that's exactly because in our culture, we don't like to suffer. Suffering denotes that I don't control my own destiny. <laughs> I cannot fix everything. Um, instead, I am dependent <laughs> and sometimes suffer for the sake of others um, or have to wait. Um, and it just fascinated me. I read David Bailey Harnett, a theologian, had written a book on it in the 1990s saying, Christians, we've given up on this virtue completely um, ever since the Industrial Revolution. And this is probably not a good thing for us because um, we actually need to know how to suffer well. And I think the pandemic has just laid that bare. <laughs> that as a society, right, we did great at making vaccines and, right, something that involved activity and pushing forward, we excelled at, but we did not do so well when it came to waiting it out and suffering and what does it mean to do this with dignity and with purpose um, and to not have control and to have to wait for something. Um, our culture just struggles. <laughs> So I said, okay, maybe we can start to show in my research program with patients, first of all, that it's actually a good thing 
Um, right. Cause if I say, if I tell people like I study patients, guess what the most common reaction is? <laughs> I mean, what would you say? If you study patients, uh, I would wonder, you know, uh, what does it mean? I yep. think, uh, you know, I, I actually looked up patients to try to, to help me figure it out. And I looked at it and it said, uh, you know, suffering without yep. getting upset. Right? right. So this whole idea that suffering happens without getting upset. And, you know, the, my quick joke is, well, you'll you'll never really be have to be done if you're studying patients. Right. Yeah. You, <laughs> you could just wait it out. Exactly. Right. And then like people are like, what is it, right? These are my common reactions, what? And then the most common reaction is, I don't have any of that, good luck, <laughs> right? And I think, right, it's like, we're just clueless on it. And, um, right, and the idea that you could suffer without getting upset, just like, what does that mean? <laughs> um, it's just very foreign to us. And well, it's a fascinating concept. I mean, to think about it, that it is, it's listed among the virtues. It's mm -hmm. uh, obviously, a, it's a fruit of the spirit. Yep. Uh, and so I, I immediately start asking operationalizing kind of questions. Yep. Does it count as patience when I'm forced to wait? Right. Is that, is that something that I can count as patience or is that, you know, I have to wait for my, my knee to heal before I'm able to go run again? Yep. Um, the no, fact, that's not that's not patience, patience. right? No, it's not the is, fact that you wait or that you suffer. It's how you do it, right? So it's different than something like in psychology, we study delay of gratification a lot, right? You probably almost everyone's heard of the marshmallow test where you sit a kid there and say, will they wait for the marshmallow for the second one or will they just eat the first one and be done, right? That's a very much a decision and an activity. <laughs> Whereas patience, is most often where you don't have a choice in whether or not you wait or suffer. You're stuck with it. <laughs> and it's, can you do that with excellence and do it well without being, my philosophy, without being inordinately saddened or upset by it? Um, and that's, right, this is actually something you can do well or poorly. Um, and... It, so what we found, and I've had to go to philosophy a lot because this isn't really a construct we have in our culture right now. Um, and it's really interesting, I think, patients, so philosophers with kind of all, many of the virtues talk about this idea of the golden mean. So this is the idea that for each virtue, you, it's not just one vice, <laughs> you actually have two vices that you're trying to avoid and you're situated between them. So a vice of excess and a vice of deficiency. Um, so with patients, we often think of the vice of deficiency of like recklessness or pushing forward and anger and, right? I don't, I mean, what is the word? But we all know rash. that feeling, rash and just trying to angrily go forward, even though you shouldn't, right? You have your knee that's hurt and say, forget it. I'm not going to listen to the doctor. I'm going to go for a walk without my crutches and injure it more, right? So you have that vice of deficiency for patients. Um, but the vice of excess, I think, is just as problematic and the one we don't think about. And that would be being too patient. So it's no longer patience then. It's a vice of acedia or kedia, <laughs> um, which might be interpreted as sloth. I like to think of it as disengagement. So it's, it's too hard. The suffering is too much. The waiting is too long that you give up. <laughs> so you actually lose the purpose, you lose the goal. Um, and I think you see this just as often um, that right, people, as they're being patient, it can be recklessly pushing forward, but then you start to almost have this learned helplessness and say, all right, I'm not going to try anymore. Um, and that's just as much of a problem. And I think people sometimes in our culture equate patience with that giving up. And that is not at all the case. What we find in the research is that patience really strikes that middle ground. Um, and 
we've actually done studies where we look at patients and goal pursuit. So I'll ask like college undergrads, like, what are you trying to accomplish this semester? What are your 10 personal goals? And then we follow them for every two weeks over a 10 week period. And we actually found that when they were patient, two weeks later, they actually exerted more effort (laughs) and found more meaning and were more satisfied with their goal pursuit than those who are less patient. Um, right. So patience actually allows you to stick with it and to keep exerting effort, even though it's hard. <laughs> and um, I think that's just that was one of our my earliest studies that I did because I needed to show that patience isn't this maladaptive response of being a doormat or just having no motivation whatsoever. It's having the right motivation wanting to work for justice, work for good in the world, um, but not falling prey to either the vice of recklessness or the vice of acedia or disengagement. Um, and I think that's true for athletes. I mean, it really applies to sports, right? It's when to push, when to not, when to not overtrain, but also don't be lazy and just wait around. Um, it requires a lot of that practical wisdom to do it. It does. And it, it strikes me that, um, you know, if you're a coach um, or a mentor in sport, you're constantly having these sorts of conversations yes. with athletes, um, trying to get them to understand. And much of it is context, mm-hmm. uh, understanding how long it takes for the development of something. So I think what you're saying, patience may not include inaction, right? Oh, no. So, Right. So you're you're constantly working at something, but the the gratification of that activity may be a long, long term pursuit. And to understand that the length of that pursuit um, is actually part of the process. Right. It's part of a part of what it takes. And that's why I'm wondering with like the application of patience in sport, how how would you see that uh, landing in a few places? Uh, Can you can you think about how? sport could be improved uh, by the appropriate application. In in sports psychology, we talk about achievement motivation versus like learned helplessness, right? Right. These sorts of things and the attribution of, you know, why things happen. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to uh, think about here, how, how is patience best applied um, in the sport context? Yeah. And I think, Patience is also, so, I mean, there's several ways I can think about it, right? So, like, the most simple is, right, that process that you see all the time of, right, rest is not an activity. (laughs) Rest is actually a choice (laughs) you make Um, and a production choice, right? And even, I think, theologically, um, thinking about, especially in, Judaism and all the old time, just there was Sabbath rest, <laughs> that this is not a meaningless activity. This is actually the most meaningful activity, um, practicing Sabbath or um, saying that I am not just an actor. <laughs> I also am a recipient <laughs> um, and that God had chose to rest. Um, so I think there's kind of that recognition (laughs) um, that patience really helps give some meat to that and gives meaning to it of what it is we're trying to do there. Um, But I think patience is also something that happens kind of in failure, (laughs) right? And, um, And even the transition, right? all athletes have their peak. (laughs) And then after that, um, they are no longer the best and their bodies are no longer at their peak and thinking about the transition to retirement um, and just in failure in general. Um, And I think it's really interesting. We did a study with elite athletes. Um, So the first study I talked about was more with not professionals at all, right? Teenagers, emerging adults, training with Team World Vision, not going to necessarily win the race, we're there to run. Um, But we've also collected data with elite athletes. Um, So former or current Olympians, um, 
Division I, NCAA Division I athletes, world competitors. Um, and this is through Ben Holtberg with his networks um, of athletes. And we with them really wanted to see what promotes patience and thinking about patience as um, something that helps you cope <laughs> with all the suffering involved in athletics. So whether the suffering of your body, um, when you actually lose and fail, <laughs> when um, the sacrifices that are made um, for sport and what we looked at there was what promotes patience and as opposed to anxiety and emotional dysregulation. Um, Cause I think emotional regulation is so important, not only for performance, but also for the well-being of the athlete <laughs> as a human, um, their mental health and wellness um, when they're competing. And then once they retire, um, that's key to their flourishing. Um, and we found that, Religion, we were looking at religion here and found that religion, again, could be really helpful and really harmful. <laughs> so when people had high intrinsic religiosity, religiousness, and were really found connection with God as an important part of their life, really pursued religion for its own sake, not for what it could get them in the world, um, that really helped them build a meaning system <laughs> that supported encountering negative events and negative emotions, um, they could reappraise those in a positive manner. So when they failed, it wasn't just, I'm a failure. <laughs> I, I'm crushed. This is now the end of my world. Um, instead, say, oh, this is an opportunity for growth, or oh, my character is developing through this, or... Um, Failure, my sport isn't the only thing that matters to who I am as a human being, right? They could reappraise in a way that allowed them to be patient and persist through negative circumstances without getting inordinately upset by them. Um, but then we found this other path that people whose religiousness was really characterized as perceiving God as highly perfectionistic <laughs> and as God has these standards and I'm never meeting them. I can't live up to them. Um, God is kind of this ultimate judge <laughs> looking down on me and dissatisfied with my performance. Um, that led to self-worth that was really contingent on performance. So whether or not I am a human being of worth and value in this world depended on whether or not I won or lost my last competition. Um, and this led to more excessive fear of failure. Because that would make sense, right? If failure indicates I'm a bad person, um, failure would become a real problem that you'd be afraid of. Um, and this led to not only more anxiety, but a whole lot less patience. Um, the other thing that was kind of striking in our model was that that positive pathway of intrinsic religiousness to meaning, to reappraisal, to patience. That pathway didn't really influence the more negative pathway, whereas at any point in the negative pathway, it could kind of undermine that positive pathway. So even if I have intrinsic religiousness, if I also have that perfectionism of God in my mind, it undercuts <laughs> my intrinsic religiousness. And it makes me have less meaning. If I have fear of failure, it doesn't just make me more anxious. It makes me have less patience. So it's this, the good, we say, we actually find this all the time in psychology, that the bad outweighs the good, <laughs> that those negative views of God or the self, they can be really potent and really undermine our well-being. So it's not only that we need to increase our positive views and increase our intrinsic religiousness and meaning in life. But we also need to sometimes directly start combating those negative views we have and very directly um, say, wait a minute, God is not perfectionistic with me. 
God loves me no matter what I do. My value is not based on my performance. Um, and I think in an application sense, that's an important take home. So if you have an athlete, just because they have a good relationship with God in general, doesn't mean they can't also have these toxic elements um, that make it really difficult for them to suffer well and to be patient. You know, the, um, I think we've just scratched the surface on this. The idea that the bad outweighs the good, uh, and yet there are alternatives. There are directions that we can go. You know, those are, those are inspiring words, uh, ominous in some ways, <laughs> right? That there, are, um, th- there is a, a great deal uh, of potential risk in, in all yep. of these things. In sport, right? There's risk. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's uh, why it's helpful that um, we continue to do this sort of work. Yep. Uh, thanks so much, Sarah, for the spending a little bit of time with us and starting to unpack your research with us. It feels like it's ongoing. That, yes. <laughs> uh, there are new questions. Uh, and that's exciting for us. That's great. That's fantastic that you continue to do that. Um, it helps us and our viewers for sure. But all of us just think about sport in a new way. Uh, and this is really fascinating. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you for having me. It's been fun to talk about this. And yes, I have new hypotheses to test. <laughs> this is the problem. Good research always creates some lot more questions than answers, but that means you're doing it right. <laughs>